Welcome to the Bandwagon Podcast, and today's episode is what truly one in the making. Um, this is the 60th episode, believe it or not. So from when we started out, um, I didn't think I was going to get this far, and I thought, you know, it is one of those numbers, 60. It almost has a certain kind of ring to it, a kind of a, a rock star flavor. And who else to get the Punjabi rock star, Jagiri? Welcome. Thank you very much, man. Thank you, Ricky. First of all, uh, namaskar, salam, piyar, pari, sashikal, and hello to everyone that's watching. And uh, congratulations on your 60th episode, man. And it's uh, nice to be part of it. Yeah, yeah, man. It, it started from nothing. It, it, it started from me. Having Every, my- everything always does, man. It starts from nothing. And, and you know, we, we, we build it to whatever we put into it. So good luck. Yeah, well yeah. done to you, man. Cheers, man. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. I think, what, I think when you're looking about a kind of like a new age and kind of a new new wave of entertainment. I, I think, like, for yourself, you've been part of a different kind of eras, and especially with your journey within, like, UK Pongra. So when I've heard your interviews over the years, when you first kind of started out when you were younger, you were had that old-school kind of mentality of going into, like, the local pubs and performing and entertaining and doing the hard yards. Can you just go back to a time? Can you just give us a bit of a background of when you started your your musical journey in that way? Yeah, uh, mate, it started as far back as school. Um, you know, I, I started when I was at school. Um, actually, no, hold on, it goes even further back than that. I started. Uh, I started in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everyone does. Everyone. Everyone does that as well. Yeah, I started um, uh, before. That, I was fortunate enough to travel a lot because my dad worked for British Airways. Uh, You know, if you're from London, um, you know, you've got members of the family that work at the airport and uh, you get the perks of working for airlines that you get to travel. So, okay, so just at that point, just for everyone else out there, the the genuine perk is more about putting more weight in the suitcase here. (laughs) Yeah, I guess so, man. It allowed me to bring back CDs from India, man, and by, by the, you know, the pile... Um, but uh yeah it started what from a very very young age i used to go to india with my parents and um i can uh, uh, i immediately got an attachment with the culture uh with our you know with marble lee and um music and just everything about punjab and our you know our roots and our history you know um of being a punjabi and um so, you know, I uh, was fortunate to be traveling there every year when I was a kid. So I got into the music. I used to go to this local music shop, ask my cousins, who's the, you know, who's the most popular singer right now? What's the latest tapes out? And I used to collect them. I used to buy them and I used to listen to them. Um, and that's where it actually started. My love for music started as far back as, um, you know, when I was in single figure age. So um, I used to then come back home. And I used to write out these songs in in, in English, uh, which what we call Roman, right? So it reads English. Uh, sorry, it reads in English, but it you it translates into Punjabi. So Bale was B A W L E, you know, like that. So and I used to say to my mom, I said uh, I used to sit with my mom sometimes and say, "Mom, is that kia? What's he saying?" Aki kenda, and we used to go through it like that. And I used to learn cover tracks. You know, I had a load of songs written in a book um, of other people's songs. And as I got older, um, I started getting more and more into it. So I did my first ever performance in school. A lot of my mates were musicians. Um, and uh, Jenny uncle from Alap, his daughter Mona, mm. she was also in my year at school. We went to uh, Villiers High School and um, we formed a band. So I put this band together and because uh, I used to do music and drama. And what was it called? Band together. Sorry? What was it called? um sugar they're gonna kill me for not remembering now i think we were called um uh encore i think <laughs> oh, God, I smashed it. yeah that was I think better than was everything. yeah i think it was something like that um I, I can't remember exactly mona remembers mona knows um and um so yeah we we had this band but before the band was actually we went out and did our first gig i got everyone together and they all looked at me and went, Jugs, you've got this band together. What are you going to do? Because I never played an instrument then, right? And they said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to sing. And they all laughed. They said, what? They said, do you sing? I said, yeah, because nobody knew then, yeah. right? And I said, yeah. I said, I, 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 I can a little bit. I said, I, you know, I said, but this is me trying to 
kind of make something of it, right? Mm. So they were like, oh, okay. So we put this band together and we started rehearsing and, you know, we, um, they were like, yeah, man, you got a vibe. This is, this is all right, man. This, this can work. So I remember we did um, Shakti Da Tol Vajda. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, we did a Tola Vitola. And uh, we did, um, I think it was Dorme Jania uh, by oh, Hida. He, he but it was him. old classics, right? Real old classics. And that's my era. That's where I come from, that, that kind of, you know, live band era. So we, we, we started rehearsing and we entered this competition at school. Um, and we entered in the category of music and dance. And uh, um, I came first. We won. And um, after that, Jenny Uncle um, invited me to his studios. And uh, he said to Mona, he said, look, if he really is into it, then invite him down. You know, I'll, I'll give you lots some help. And we then, that band, we kind of fine tuned it and uh, we started performing. We started performing with Alap. So when Alap would have a gig, we would go out and open for them and do like two, three tracks, four tracks, and then Alap would come on. So that's how the journey started. And that was, you know, that's going back some years, man. Um, it was like 30 odd years ago that was. And so they, then I think that's really important to say, because in terms of like, I think you may, you may not get enough credit for that in terms of like putting those hard yards in. Because yeah. I think you probably, uh, just from kind of my interpretation and, and maybe seeing perception is probably the, the correct word, is that you where you come in a little bit later, um, part of the new wave kind of of the music in the early 2000s but your original kind of flavor was going to looking at the old school kind of live bands material and and really getting getting into that yeah so what i fused was at that time was desi music that i was listening to from india so i was listening to people like ranjit mani um harpa janman kuldeep manakdi um you know uh, dilshad akhtar uh, you know, some of these names that I mentioned, some people of today's age will go, who the hell is that? You know, they won't even know who I'm talking about. But I was then listening to them, born in the UK, in a Punjabi family where I weren't allowed to speak English at home. So that was my my teaching of Punjabi came from home. Like we'd get a clip around the ear hole if we were speaking English at home. You know, it was like, mom and dad was like, Kare Punjabi bolo, bar jo bolo na boli jayo. right? So they said, if you want to, if, and if you don't know something, Sanupo Cho will tell you. But because my mom and dad spoke in Punjabi in the house 24-7, you hearing it and you're picking it up, right? Um, and I think that is a big, big thing um, in today's day and age where, you know, um, with my wife, I don't speak it, I don't speak Punjabi with my wife. We find it, we find it a bit weird, right? It's a bit funny mm. because we're both born and raised in the UK. So our first language really is English, right? But our mother tongue is Punjabi. But when we speak between ourselves, we find it really funny. So naturally, my kids find it a little bit funny as well to speak yeah. Punjabi, even though I do encourage it. My eldest, she understands it all. And we play little games like she'll say, Daddy, say something in Punjabi and I'll tell you what it means. So she understands it and she'll get it in 10 out of 10. Right. But she feels a little bit uncomfortable speaking it because it's not spoken on a daily basis in my house, you know? Yeah, um, my, my kids are exactly the same, where if we start speaking Punjabi, they start laughing and giggling. And yeah. Then, uh, and then um, whenever we're trying to, it's like a secret code language of me and my wife talking. You know, how, talking sorry like, to interrupt you, right? Okay. But how sad is that? Oh, like, it's, it's extremely You know, funny. I find it kind of upsetting. I think, yeah. you know what? I don't care how much they laugh. We need to speak more of it because we're diluting our, our culture and our Punjabi bully like so much by the time they grow up they ain't gonna know a word of it no. their kids aren't gonna know a word of it our grandkids are not gonna know Punjabi if we don't enforce it now you know, I also still think in terms of like the music and stuff plays a huge part in terms of where like uh it's my son now for example he listens to quite a lot of Bhangra and, yeah. um, and then he he listens he picks it up and, and when he, he I encourage him to kind of sing along and yeah for me that's kind of like that's a way of teaching yeah peaceful, uh, I know there's a bit of reassurance then but the ultimately, yeah. and this is a very hard intake. It's our failure. With the you can't 100%. you can't even say to is it grandparents all this. We drop the ball. You know what? This is what they say, right? When you point the finger, there's three fingers pointing at you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You say to your kids, <laughs> "Who didn't teach you?" 
yeah. it's us. Yeah, we didn't put in enough. We didn't put enough effort in to teach them. But anyway, that's we're going off track a bit there. No, now, no, but, but it's all, it, no, but it's all, it's all relevant. It's important though. It is. is gonna, it's important. This this dictates future markets because if absolutely if if your if the children of the next generation don't recognize the language, the, there's something about the music that's in the blood that will always make you move in a certain way. It, it's just natural. Yeah. Well, I, but if they if they're not picking up the language or to at least uh, take the time to understand the heritage, then the, 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 those next gen of artists we're, we're we're giving them a really harder market to to delve with. Mm, absolutely, no, you're absolutely right, hundred percent. So you know your um, so your relationship then from with music then moves away from uh, encore. Let's just call it encore now. That that is the band's name. So regardless what Mona says. Yeah. Um, yeah. How did you then make the next step up? Were you, because what was your peers like at that time? Who who else was kind of on the up and coming scene? What was the scene like? Okay, so at that time, initially when we started with the band, I didn't know any singers. Um, I didn't know any um, producers. Only people that I knew were within my band um, that I went to school with who were musicians. And then I met Jenny Uncle. So Jenny Uncle is... You know, he's like a he's like a father figure. He's an uncle. He's a ustad. You know, he was the one that gave me, you know, the helping hand and, and gave me the the kind of entry into music and seeing what it was about and going into a studio at the age of like 12, 13. Um, and, and I was if you pick up right, if you pick up some of his old albums like um, Chum Chum Nachadi Fira and mm -hmm. stuff like that, um, there was a. Uh, there was um, in the backing, in the credits. Nowadays, you don't get these these hard copies, man. So you can't pick up stuff and see who who did the backing vocals, who was the producer, yeah, who yeah. picked the, the inlays, the inlays. Yeah, man, the inlay was uh, was a big part of collecting music back then because you wanted to go and get it and then read the inlay and see what's in there. Um, and um, so I um, was on the backing vocals for a lot of Uncle's older albums, and I was in there as Jag hyphen e jaggy so but it was spelt with a bit of an english touch so yeah and uh that was um that was going back some some years man and then like i said the band we'd put together was we were opening and performing at like charity events and um you know um where a lot was playing we'd go out and open for them and do a few tracks and after that i just got a buzz for music you know and um so we had that band and we, we did that for about a few years. And then we um, went off to uni, college and uni. When I was at college, I was still singing. But by that time, I'd made a load of friends that were DJs. So friends that were DJs would start calling me up saying, Jugs, do you want to go to this gig? Just drop a few bolian. And I was like, yeah, why not? So people like um, Asian DJ culture. Mm. Do you know who Asian DJ? Yeah, yeah they're, that's a that's a all London based. Thing. I'm I'm more Birmingham. And okay, but, but do you know who Asian DJ culture was? I'm gonna guess based on it now. I'm gonna get this completely wrong. I'm probably gonna go for men. No, is it the Extreme Hot Boys? No, no, Extra Hot Boys. no. Okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you who it was. But. Asian DJ culture was uh, Punjabi Hit Squad. Right, D, uh, um, Sunil, uh, Sunil Kalia, not Sunil, sorry, uh, Rajiv, uh, Rajiv, Mark, Kalia. Mark was... and Mark, yeah, they were all they were called Asian DJ culture back then, wow. many, many years ago. And then Raj passed away, um, and um, uh, there was um, Raj, Ammo, um, D, uh, Mark, so they were there was this one crew, then he passed away, and then they set up. Punjabi hit squad that was Rav, D, Ammo, and the Mark. Oh. And then it was down to uh, the three of them. Now it's the two of them, you know? Um, and that was, that was, we all grew up together. They're from my ends, you know? And yeah. so they, I remember going to gigs at uh, Limelight and stuff like that in London. And they'd play, um, they'd play some beats, instrumentals and jungle and stuff. And I'd, I'd sing Punjabi body over it. And mm -hmm. so I started getting to clubs like that. I, I remember. I, I could be completely wrong here, and I normally am. So bear with me. Uh, one, of, I remember you did it, and I, I'm going to reference it a couple of times because it really played. It really played on my mind. Where you did an interview once with uh, Bobby Friction, which was a no filter interview on the on the, on the Asian Network. Yeah. 
And that was the first time where I saw a different aspect to an artist. I don't think anyone, one other person, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, when I interview him, I will tell him that. Um, uh, in, in fact, it was hate on me when I heard a, a very long format interview, more than the usual 10 minutes or, or 15 minutes. And in, in there, you talked about something that was similar to what Gradas Man uh, said, where he had to audition for the first time and he, he sang a song in front of all these producers and music directors. And he felt, he felt so degraded at that time because he knew his own value. And he was trying to um, win the audition or convince those other people at that same time. And you said something similar where you were singing in a pub. And I think you were saying that you can chill out at that point. And the audience around him, you kind of lost yourself in the in the music and you didn't care who was around it because that was your that was your um your character, your your style, the way that you did it. Mm. Do you still feel the same way now as when you go on stage back from when you were where you do those kind of pub gigs? Well, I don't do pub gigs. Um, I mean, I'm talking when you first started, when you first, when you were going yeah. around on the singing circuit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, when I when I first started doing those gigs, I loved them because I I used them as just a rehearsal. So I was open to criticism. I was open for people to say, because that taught me which what kind of song suited my voice. You know, I learned a lot from that. And even when I went to the pub and I asked them to perform there, uh, it was my dad's local pub, right? And um, it had just changed hands. It was a new management came in. So they revamped the pub and everything. And um, there was, um, it was a gora called Alan. And he used to wear a gora. So he used to understand Punjabi and he used to say a few words. His dad spoke a bit of Punjabi. They were Irish, uh, wicked people. And um, some of the people that, if, that are watching this that are from West London, South always, they'll know who I'm talking about. Mm. Um, and they used to be on Beaconsfield Road. They used to be at um, Beaconsfield Arms. They used to have that pub. Then they moved to the Red Lion. So anyway, I went in there one day and I just went and spoke to the guy and I said, listen, I said, look, you're you're in a predominantly 99% Indian area, right? How about I turn up here on a Friday with a few musicians and we do um we do a little gig? And he went, oh, okay. He goes, um, right, uh, how much do you want? I went, I don't want nothing. I said, I want to do it every Friday. I said, I want to do it regularly, maybe every Friday or every fortnight. Um, he said, all right. He said, what, you don't want anything for it? I said, no. Nah. I said, look, I said, I want to just treat it as a, as a rehearsal spot for me. You know, I can come, I can jam, I can put on a show. I said, and for me, it's going to benefit me in different ways. I said, from you, I don't want anything. I said, um, and, and my, in, in Indian culture, if they like something and there's someone singing, they'll, they'll throw money. I said, so if that happens, I'll keep that. And, um, you know, that's it. And it will just hopefully attract some, some more punters through the door. And he went, all right, when can you start? I said, let's do this Friday. And that's how it went. You know, and I didn't care. I really didn't care what people thought because I believed in myself. And that's a big thing that when, you know, people, um, upcoming singers, when they ask this, I, I'd say that to them all. I said, look, if you don't believe in yourself, no one's going to believe in you, you know, and that's the biggest thing. And it's not just about music. It's about anything. If you've got a product, if you've got a service, if you don't believe in that product or service, then nobody, you can't expect anyone else to believe in it either, you know? Um, and so, yeah, those pub gigs were brilliant, man. I, I, I loved doing them. And that's, how I met that's how I met so many people so many musicians so many other singers um and then I met Rishi through you know while I was singing in the pubs a friend of mine introduced me to him and I went and auditioned at Rishi's and you know um rest his soul in peace man uh Balwinda Safri Baji you know uh it was his song that I auditioned with mm. uh, when I went to the studio back in 2001 I went to the studio for the first time. I didn't know who Rishi was. I know I was not into Too Cool or Love to Love. I didn't listen to Punjabi. Sorry, not Punjabi. I didn't listen to Bollywood stuff then. And that's what he was known for. You know, he'd made like loads of albums. And um, I was invited by him through a friend to the studio to go and audition because Rishi was finishing off his album at that time. And uh, I went there and he, we met and he said, uh, yeah, go into the booth and uh, sing me your favourite song. And I sang Pod uh, And that was my favourite song. Wow. So and that is a very hard song to sing as well. <laughs> mate. Yeah, so, so that was my favourite because it had that, you know, it had at the beginning, it had that. Mm-hmm. 
ਤਾਵਾਂ ਤੇ ਗਿੱਦੜਾ ਹਾਨੂੰ ਤੇ ਕੈਦ ਪਿੰਜਰੇ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸ਼ੇਰ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਹੀ ਰਸਤੇ ਖੁੱਲ then it goes into the song wow you know so it was that like that kind of i thought yeah that gives a like you know it, it gives a, a, a bit of a, a, a feel of what i can do to a certain i mean uh, and, and and you know what before i go any further um i don't even now call myself a singer because i've not been i've not been classically trained right i'm raw as they come i've sung in pubs i sing from the heart right and i i can sing in key sometimes i hit bum notes it's cool right but one thing i always say in interviews is i'm an entertainer right i'm not a singer i go on stage and i put on a show and that's what i've been doing from day one when i walk into a pub i put on a show when i walk on stage i put on a show and that's why touch wood is 20 years and i'm still getting booked today i was you know like in in terms of your um you know especially in football where you say put your medals on the table yeah you, you could get your diary out and say who's the best of the best and say come on test me yeah it's quite yeah. it's phenomenal even if you just follow your instagram you're knackered yeah <laughs> <laughs> you don't know, like now i've been so fortunate yeah like last weekend i did five gigs in four days i was so busy and so tired that i didn't even have time to post any of those shows like they're still sitting on my you know like you do it one night and then you think yeah i'll go home and i'll post it by the time you get home you're battered and you're like and then the next day you're up and you're traveling again to your next destination mm. you get there you do your sound check then you get you know it's just it last weekend this whole july and august has been great for all dj's planner wedding planners singers um everyone has been so busy it's been great because post covid you know we needed this yeah. um but yeah i'm so grateful man so fortunate and so grateful that people still pick up their phone and say we want to book you man yeah. and uh you know this i must be doing something right when i step on that stage for people to keep on doing that you know that, um, even, and that's why that's why i put right that to you Sorry even your biggest critic can't ever take that away from you. Yeah and that's why and that's what I work for. That's what I live for and you know people say oh you ever put no music out. You know what I might put out one song in like 2 years right? But I put those songs out just to keep the phone ringing. That's what I do. Yeah. yeah. That works for me, right? My thing is as long as the money's keep the song coming in I can keep a roof over my head for my kids and put food on the table and have my little luxuries that I want along the way. but that is my, my that's my method like i'll put a song out boom i'm gone i'm back on the road but but also the market's changed i mean it's only been recently where you've seen a huge push back onto the albums again but it was a singles market and i and i think yeah. siddu drove that didn't he with the amount of like how how consistently he was putting out music he was increasing the pace he was putting the pressure on everyone the yeah. albums come out but i think you're right you you know your formula what was good for you and then um you know and it and it worked out you know what i mean and it still does to this day i want yeah. i want to uh, go back to your, your your first single your first major single when did you know that oh, oh okay something's happening here now this is this is the one uh it it happened after it even came out it didn't even mm. happen while or before or you know immediately after it happened a little while after because at the beginning i was just living the dream like i just wanted so after after having the band performing in pubs um that went on for 10 years i had a band performing in pubs doing nightclub gigs and just as i didn't even have an artist name they would just say well, like who are you i'm like, juggy just put down juggy j a g hyphen e yeah mm-hmm. and then i used to have a mate um, whose name was bobby so it was juggy J- jag hyphen e and bob hyphen e juggy and bobby right and we did um gigs we started i remember i did um i did a gig the first ever flyer that i was on i uh, i think i've still got it somewhere it was a little white kind of like a postcard and it was in black and white and it was called 1942 a love story and that was in west london in alperton and it was a club gig and it said jiggy and bobby on that one and that was going back some years man um and it was uh my first ever gig where i i think i got paid for it maybe 50 quid or something like that um if that or it was we just did it for free and i didn't care about them because it was a stab passion you know um at that time how was your family balancing kind of your own kind of pressures did your almost your uh, old school kind of marriage age there you getting pressured i'm sure those conversations were saying 
you know, get, uh, you know, I'm just saying it's stereotypically get a pro- get a job, do this, do this properly. And... No, I had a job. I had a job. <laughs> play, play, this play was back. a side thing. This was just a side thing. I was like, you know, I was in and out of work all the time. Um, you know, in and out. Of, uh, while I was at uni, I was like getting summer jobs. So I was, I was always working. I started working from from the age of, I think it was eleven or twelve. I started working very, very young age. That's another story that um, you know for another day. But I started working at a very, very young age, um, and um, I, you know, I, I, I just anything I did, I kind of did myself, man, off my own back, you know. It, and it, and it was with a lot of hard work and effort. Um, it nothing happened overnight, um, but you know. I always believe that like what you put in is what you're going to get out. Right. And like I said, 10 years, it, it was a 10 years of being in music um, without kind of even releasing a record before I met Rishi. And that was off the back of people saying to me, Jugs, you need to do something. You need to release something. Like my college mates, my school mates, everybody was like, you need to do something because we love hearing you. And if we love hearing you, imagine how many other people might like hearing you. You know, they might like your voice. They might like your songs. And I went, you know what? I said, I don't know where to go. I said, I don't have no producer mates. I said, I got like, you know, I got Jenny Uncle and stuff. I said, but, you know, they're busy doing their thing. And I I didn't really want to ask them because they'd helped me a lot along the way anyway. And I said, you know, I said, if it's meant to be, it'll it'll happen. Um, And then I got introduced to Rishi and that's where it started. And when we did Najina, uh, excuse me, that was my first song in 2002. And I went to meet him and after we, I did that audition, um, he said to me, right, you know what? I want you to sing. He stopped me about, just after I started singing the verse, he stopped me and he said, come out. And I thought, oh, he didn't like it, right? And he's gone, sit down. He goes, um, all right, listen, I like your vibe. He goes, but I don't want you to sing folk and this, he styled Punjabi music. Yeah. I went, all right. I said, uh, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to do pop Punjabi music. And I was like, mm, okay. I said, it's not really my thing, you know. I said, I've grown up on Galdeep Manak and Gadasman. And I said, I'm more dissy, bro. I said, like, I'm I'm a I'm a proper bendu head, you know? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, but you know what? I want you to, I want you to sing on the album, but it's got to be that vibe. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so I was like, Chal Tika, let's see in it. Let, let's let's um yeah. let's let's see how it goes. So I sat with him and he was like, okay, when can you, when can you come in to, to record? I said, what are we going to record? He goes, don't worry. He goes, I'll, I'll get a writer in and uh, we'll sit down and we'll write a song. And I said, well, I can't write. He said, all right, don't worry. He goes, I've, I've got the writer. He goes, so there was a guy called uh, Daljit from East London, doll player, Iceman Dolly. I don't know. If oh you yeah, remember. yeah, I remember. Yeah, he's in the video as well, isn't he? Was he That's the... right. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he wrote, well, he didn't write it himself. He <laughs> co-wrote. That's where I learned I could write, write as well. So I ended up writing Najina with him. And we came in one day and we sat there and um, uh, Dalj had a, he had a bit of a writer's block and he was like, I can't, I don't, can't come up with anything. I don't know, I'm just nothing happening. So Rishi was like, look, just go outside, just have half an hour and come back in. He goes, you ain't going nowhere today. He goes, I want this song done today because my album's done. I got one more song to put on it. And I, this, is the, this is the guy I want to put on it. And he's like, all right, cool. So I've gone out there and I just started vibing with him. And he was going, all right, yeah, I like that. So I gave him a couple of lines of um, this song, which was Najina, and he's bloody gone, all right, I like that. That's a nice line. That's a nice line. And we've just, um, you know, just started vibing. And from there, we wrote the verse, we wrote the hook, and we went back in and he was like, yeah, we've got the, we've got, we've got the song. And he's like, all right, I like it. So finish the track. Sorry, the song lyrically wrote it and then um he said uh rishi said to me he goes um all right when can you come and record this and i think this was like a like a this was i auditioned on a sunday i went in like the following day to do to write the song um and then he went when can you come in and i said you tell me he goes all right go away today he goes learn it and uh come back on wednesday i was like you know like sorry i was like damn that's quick yeah so Anyway, I've gone away, come back in on the Wednesday, and I've vocal the song. Vocal the song, and I've left, right? Four or five days later, he phones me up saying, Jugs, what are you doing? I said, nothing, I said, my own. He goes, do you want to come and hear your song? I was like, what? He said, yeah, it's finished. I was like, nah. He said, yeah, I've got someone else featured on it as well. I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, that's, that's mad. He's like, yeah, yeah, come down. 
So I went down and uh, it was literally within a week this happened. So we, from, from meeting him to writing the song, learning it, vocaling it, and then hearing it. And uh, it was just phenomenal, man. It was like, wow, I've got a song. This is what I wanted. I just wanted to do one song. That was my dream. Like, all I want to do is one song. That's it. I didn't know what was going to happen after that. I didn't know what was going to happen to, you know, anything else after that career wise, or if I was going to become a musician or a singer or whatever. I didn't know nothing. I just wanted to do one song that could be put out there and show, say to my mates, look, I've done it. Yeah. And um, so we've done the song. I heard it and I was like, okay, cool. I was like, who's this black guy on there? He's like, he's not black. He's Indian. I went, huh? He's like, yeah, he's Indian. He's a Gujarati guy. I was like, what are you on about? I said, this kid sounds black. He's like, nah, his name's Don D. So that was him featured on the song. And then I played the song to my mates, my close mates, and they hated it. They absolutely hated it. They said, bro, what is this? They said, why are you singing like that for? And I went, bro, you know what? I said, I said, the producer wanted me to do this, man. They said, yeah, but you sing dissy songs, man. Like, what happened to your dissy vibe? I said, bro, I said, he said, look, this is what I want you to do, that everybody out there is singing like this. And that time, uh, Lember was massive. And yeah. that, that, in the early 2000s, Punjabi Desi stuff was big, yeah? yeah Kaka was on the scene as well. Exactly. Kaka, all of that, right? Yeah. And it was a big Desi movement then. Now, Rishi's concept was, he said, look, if you do something Desi, it's just going to mix in with everything else. He goes, you do something pop, it's going to go against the grain and it's going to get heard. And people will go, raw, okay, this is different. What's this? Who's this? And he was absolutely right. Because that's exactly what happened. You know, you know what it is. Uh, you know why I laughed a little bit with you, mate. Because the first, the first time I heard that, I was like, "What?" Because I'm a pro. I love that old school. Yeah. yeah. Then we're in um, my mummy's son's, um, my cousin's uh, uni place in Leicester. Yeah. At the Montford. and there was, as you know, we're getting ready to go out, and uh, everyone's blasting music. And that's the first time I heard the song on repeat and I, it just kept repeating all night. Yeah. And it was just so catchy. I just yeah. found myself singing the song. Yeah. And then uh, then they saw the video and like Justy's in there as well. And, you know, for your first time having Justy to do in there and all the, you know, all that credibility in this, oh shit, there's a movement here. There's something that's going on. And it was completely different. I'm like Punjabi pop, where, you know, like, I don't know whether who's done it before or not, but that was a significant. You know, when you hear a song, then it. Oh, no, no. Before, really yeah, before that, it that was like that was like a Johnny Z Taz. Yeah, buddy, yeah, yeah. Rest his soul. That yeah. was his style. That was that was that kind of vibe. You know, um, there wasn't many other people doing that apart from him. I can really say that was doing pop Punjabi music. You know, there was Taz. There was maybe a few other people, uh, but. Uh, I can't really think of anyone else. And, and that broke the door for India f virtually quick, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's what I mean. It's like overnight, like that song came out. It went number one in the DC charts. Uh, I can't remember what uh, station it was on, but it was number one on Sunrise Radio or whatever. But it was on, it was number one for about six weeks when that, and, and how it became that, it was mad because I just did a song, right? For me, from my side, it was like, I've done a song. And then everything that started happening around it was what then made me go, okay, this, I think we're onto something here now because like, so first and foremost, Bally Sagu signed that album, right? It came out on Ish, the album was called Simply Rich. Mm. And my song was the last song on the album, right? And when Rishi delivered it to, uh, to Bally, Bally sat down and he started playing the tracks and he went through all the songs and uh, he got to the last track. And the last track was Najina. And he played it and he heard it and he went, what the? He said, who's this? And he goes, Tarishi, who's this kid? He said, oh, he's just some new guy that I found. Like I got introduced to him, he's from Southall. And he went, okay. He went, yeah, he's a young lad, like early 20s, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and he went, mate, he goes, Rish, he goes, this is, this is your single. He goes, this is what's going to sell the album. And he was like, okay. He goes, yeah. He goes, you reckon? He goes, yeah. He goes, not reckon. He goes, I know it. He goes, this is your lead track. He goes, this is the song that's going to... And um, they got on the phone to me. They got on the phone to me and uh, they said, uh, uh, Rishi rang me and he said, Jugs, um, I've, I've delivered the album. Uh, Bally's heard it and they want to shoot a video to your song. 
I was like, nah, what are you talking about, man? I said, stop chatting rubbish, man. I said, you're, you're pulling my leg. He went, no, I'm telling you honestly, like he wants to shoot a video. He wants this to be the title song of the album. I was like, wow, that's mad. He said, um, yeah, he goes, he's heard the rest of the album. And for me, that was a big thing because out of all of the tracks on the album, they've selected my song, you know, which is like, okay, wicked, man. It made me feel good about myself, you know? It's like, okay, <clears throat> we've got something here. Then I had some, you know, there was some stuff happening and um, I almost didn't make the video shoot. And, and funny enough, I, I just spoke to Bali the other day. After years, I rang him just because I wanted to know when, what the actual date, release date of Neijina was. And this year is the 20 year anniversary of Neijina. It wow. came out in 2002. So we are celebrating 20 years of Juggy D this year. That's mad. Yeah. That's so mad. that's where it started, man. That song changed my life. That ch song changed my, my whole... That week? Life. That week? Yeah, that, that one week. That one week. That one week changed my... That made me... Um, at, that put me out there as Juggy D. Like, and then the questions started coming in. Right, who is this guy? Is his dad a singer? Is he from a musical family? Like, and it was no, no, no. It's just some kid who loved singing and Rishi found him and he recorded a track and, and here he is. That, that's, this is him. Um, and did you start, I'm guessing the next questions would have come up or what we're doing next. Did you feel a real pressure at that time to think, uh oh, look, this song's exploded. And it's, it's like that second season syndrome in, in some ways. Did you, did you feel, uh oh, uh, what, what I need to plan it out? Or did you just trust Rishi so much to say, or nah. I just didn't care? <laughs> yeah, I didn't care at all. I was just living the moment. I was just living in the moment of having a song that's just blown up overnight and everyone's going, this is wicked, loving it. I remember this was this was this was the moment for me that that really kind of went, wow, wow, man, this is mad. Because I always said, so I used to collect music, right? I used to collect vinyl, I used to buy C um, TDK tapes, CDs were, were just coming through at the time, right? Um, but people were still like myself collecting vinyl and um buying tapes. I used to go to Metro Music on South of Broadway. Right, Sunny Suri, his parents own that shop. Sunny Suri is uh, he does um, um, media, a PR, and stuff like that, right? And um, he um, had a shop on the Broadway. They used to sell music, and I said to myself, my dream was that Jidarmiri Deepagi, the day my song releases, I'm gonna go walk to the Broadway and I'm gonna go buy it. I'm gonna go buy that single or that album, that ever, whatever my song is on. I'm gonna go buy it. So. I left my house, the day it came out, I left my house and my mum and dad live in Southall and it's one straight road that goes to, uh, down the Uxbridge Road onto the Broadway and I'm walking along, yeah? I'm walking along and this car pulls up right next to me. Bunch of lads and girls in the car, windows down, they're blasting Neijina. And I was like, what? This is mad, right? It was the first experience. My hair stood up on end just when I said that even now. Like, I was like, what the hell? This is mad. These kids, are... and they were jamming in the car. And they had no idea that the singer is just right there walking past them, right? I Like, my song was bigger than me that at the time. I was like, I was a nobody. But my voice and my song had kind of made it into people's cars, you know? And they were listening to it and going, this is sick. And I've just I had the biggest smile on my face. And I was like, wow, man. This is this is something's happened now, you know. And uh, got to the shop, and I went to, uh, went to see Auntie, and I said, Auntie, I want to get that out. And she's like, blah, 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 blah. I said, Yeah. She said, No, 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 just take it. I said, No, nah, I want to buy it. I want the receipt. And so I bought the track, and that was the, that was that that moment, man, where you know it all just changed for me. And I was like, then I was like, Yeah, you know, whatever happens next is cool. I'm not, I'm not even bothered if another song comes out uh, because I I did what I wanted to do. And it's a hit, you know? And uh, I said, you know what? That, that's good enough for me. But then, you know, it went from, from Neijina. My next song was featuring with Craig David. Mad. I remember, I remember hearing you, you, you might have been with Jay Short on Chris Moyles or show, uh, Or was it, on, was it on Big Breakfast? One of the two, because he, he hosted Big Breakfast for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. We were, on all, we were all over mainstream media, man. It was, it was a phenomenal time, man. And, it was just a massive movement that I was so happy and so, 
so grateful and proud to be part of. You know, we we really did change the the the, the sound um, and made a, a, a huge dent in the music industry, which is there even now. Like when we talk about it, like I was talking about it to somebody the other day because they they called to book. It was a friend of mine who wanted to book me for a gig in Dubai, and we were just chatting and. Um, he was like, Jugs, he goes, you know what? He goes, it's mad, right? He goes, because every time I talk about gigs, he goes, your name always comes up because people want to keep booking you. And I, he said, it's one, it's because, you know, he goes, you, you, you're great on stage. He goes, two, he goes, you're with lots of music from that era. There was something special about it that people are still listening to it now. And he said, now, like, we'll get a song, we'll come out six months, it'll be massive, and then it's gone. It's like, week, it's almost, even a day? Yeah, it's like it's almost come and gone, and it's like then you hear it like two years later, and you might go, "Oh, who was that?" You know, you don't even remember who released it, yeah. when it came out, or whatever. And I said, "Yeah, I know, man." I said, "I'm so like," I said, "Even I mean, just that era, that whole movement, that whole time, Raghav, you know, Bombay." Because I mean, obviously, we did a lot of shows abroad. So when we were we were traveling abroad, uh, India, whether it was Pakistan, whether it was Dubai, there was a there was a certain movement from all over that traveled together. And it was outlandish from um Copenhagen, Denmark ways, right? It was uh, Bombay Rockers, I think they were from there there as well. Um and then it was uh, Raghav, then it was us guys, obviously Punjabi MC, Bali Sagu, you know, there was there was a movement, man, RDB boys. Um, like we'd all turn up to these gigs around the world. And it was, it was mad. It was absolutely mad. And those people, you still can listen to their music now and go, I know exactly who that was. I know when it was. I know where I was when that song came out. You're, you're a very switched on person. I, I've spoken to you privately and, uh, as well. And you always get that sense check of like, you know what you're doing. When you, are you aware? You know, when you when you were learning, um, obviously you had the industry working in the UK. You also had the same problem as what you just said there, where internationally to know another game in a, the same game in a different country brings all sorts of different new challenges. What was the biggest difference that you know you noticed between how things were being operated here and when when you were making more music and in India? Um, do you know what it, I think? It's just like. Because you're still getting booked there right now. So I'm saying whatever yeah. you've done, is you've done correctly, right? Yeah. But there's only a few artists who have ever cracked both of bo- both of those mar- markets. Yeah. I'm just trying to say, how do you, what, what could you pin that down to? I, I think we can only pin that down to how we were marketed. You know, how we were marketed, the PR around it. Um, and, you know, we came from a time where there was no social media, man. It was hard graft. It was a hard graft going out to market your music, you know, um, doing the school tours, getting out on the road and, and actually physically handing out CDs and samplers, um, going into radio, uh, doing press conferences and doing them abroad. That was what we used to do. And I just did that again just now. I brought that vibe back again for for India when I just released recently with the Amit Rai, UB1, the track mm-hmm. UB1. We went to India and I and I said, this is the way this is the way I want to do it. I want to promote this song in India and I want to do it like this. And, and we made it happen. You know, we did a press conference in Delhi. We did a press conference in Punjab and we had all the media turn up under one roof. We fed them. We played the video to them. We told them a bit of background history. And then individually, they sat with me one by one and they all interviewed me talking about the past and talking about the future and talking about the present moment and that song that we just released, you know, and it all just boils down to, um, I, I think obviously the product has a massive part to play with it uh, because at the time when, you know, um, we just celebrated uh, 19 years of dance with you, you know, and that was a, that was a game changing moment where India had not heard like an English artist and an Indian artist on the same record. You know, for them, it was like, whoa, what is this? So we crossed over and went over the pond straight away. That song came in a movie. And that was our entry into, you know, that international world. Because then it was like, okay, these guys are big in the UK. They're big in India. And that's then it just had a ripple effect all around the world. And see, the thing is, 
the biggest form and the strongest form of marketing and PR is word of mouth, right? If somebody tells you something, you will take their word for it more than kind of going, okay, I'm going to go research who's the best singer because it's like, that's long, isn't it, really? Yeah. Like, who really actually even does that? Like, you just see it now, just pop up on feeds and, you know, so, but when the way we kind of were put across to everyone was the people were burning CDs or tapes and passing them to their cousins and saying, listen to this. These are the, these are the boys that I just released this track. They're hot. They're like the hottest thing at the moment in the UK. And that was like kind of what I was doing when I was a kid in India going, asking my cousins, who's the best singer at the moment? Who's got the biggest song at the moment? And then, you know, when like that, that went around from going from UK like we were doing, we were doing, we toured the world together back in two, from 2003 to say 2006, seven for about five years without any social media. It's like, we'd get to also when we first landed in Australia, we went, is anybody even going to turn up to the show? We'd question ourselves like, yeah. like what's going to happen here? Like we had no idea. Right. And then we'd turn up to the show and bro, there were like queues of people outside waiting to get, like, cause we do a, like a CD signing first before the show. So that would happen like either a day before or say six hours before, you know, and it was a build up to the, to the event. And it was mad seeing queues of people. And we're going, Oh my God. Like all these people have turned up to come and see us. And that was just phenomenal, man. It was just, how, how are you balancing it? Like I've said it before and the work life balance is really important with this and uh, with the, because you, you could get carried away with your artist success around that, but individually, as as a person in yourself, was it too easy to get distracted in, in in that and kind of switch focus on it? Because obviously, you there's there's you as the artist and you as an individual. Yeah, of course. I mean, look, you know what my what my life had a lot of ups and downs, you know, um, and there was a lot of things that I had to deal with, uh, and and still have been dealing with. Um, which affect your everyday life and your career and your whatever, you know? Um, so, you know, life is, life is, um, life has always been a bit of a challenge, man. But, you know, I always believe in taking something positive out of every negative and just keeping your head up and, and like, and dealing with it, you know, uh, and not crying about it and going, look, okay, if I need help in this area, I'm going to go seek for it. You know, if I need to do this, um, how can I do that? How can I overcome this? So I don't look at it as a problem. I just look at it as a learning curve, you know? Um, yeah, because so, I, remember, I remember seeing you as a... Uh, I remember I met you once at Samson's, with uh, Samson's Palace with, with, the, with one of my mates. And you're a big lad then. Um, mm. And then all of a sudden, the next time I saw you, fucking hell, he's got a six-pack. I was like, this guy is committed. It's all or nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's... That, that is the nail on the head, bro. It's, I, I've been... Sometimes it doesn't work in your favor doing that. Um, it can work against you um, being an all or nothing kind of guy. But that is me in a nutshell. I'm all or nothing. And when I put my mind to something, I will give it my all, you know. And, um, you know, it's, it, it goes without saying that we've, we've now, we've, being on that topic, you know, I had a year and a half ago, I had some stuff go on that was all over the media. Um, and a lot of it was, was, was blown out of proportion, you know, and one of the things that I will say that, you know, the, the headline was Juggy D arrested for, for domestic violence. Right. Um, and even my missus said to me, she said, you need to clear that up because that's not what happened. You know, things don't get me wrong. Things did happen. Think I did make mistakes and I owned them. Right. But that didn't happen. I'd never hit my wife mm. um, and I never got arrested. And she mm. said to me, she said, you know what? That will really tarnish somebody's re uh, re um, uh, reputation because women hate when they're that like, abusive to their woman, you know? Mm. And she said, you're not that guy. So you need to clear that up. So, but I haven't really, I didn't really kind of go public about it and go, you know what, uh, this, uh, yeah, this, out uh, because I'm not that, I, I don't care what people think anymore, you know? Mm. I don't really care. I mean, a little part of me does because I think, all right, well, I'm in the public eye. Um, and, and maybe I need to need to answer to it. And then there's a part of me that goes, Jugs, just forget it, man. Leave it. Just, just, uh, you know, like they say um, in Punjabi, they say, uh, panda is half yeah. right? Just, just clear out the mess out of your panda and just get, get focused. You know, after all of that, like before that all happened, I was teetotal. 
Then I went over to India. I started drinking again because it was all around me. Now I'm, I'm, I'm nearly one year sober again. You know, um, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. You know, but I've people know that, you know, in the past I've been there, you know, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it. I've had issues. I've had problems in my life, you know. Well, you, so you now, got the, if people are surprised by that, you've got the name of Punjabi rock star for a for a reason. Yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? yeah, no, but absolutely. I mean, like you know, when you you said very early on in um, in the interview about you know trying to take something positive out of the situation, I, I'm guessing even at that time you always find out who your close circle is in terms of who's going to stand with you, and you work these things out, and you know from from there. And I think the media is very clickbaity. They'll snap things together and they'll put it down and the way that things got presented at a time you think of it and you only could go on what you see and you're like oh bloody hell this is going on there do you 100 you, you know and we are in that kind of cancel culture and stuff like that you know yeah. if you were looking at back as a juggy d now and then speaking uh, and, uh, and looking at the juggy d then what was the best piece of advice that you could give to yourself back then and also what would be the best piece of advice you'd give to somebody else um, look, you know what it is, yeah? Uh, I don't think I, I, I'm not one to give advice to anybody, you know? I think everybody's life and everybody's uh, journey is different, right? But one thing I would say is what I've learned from this is sometimes bad times make you a better person, right? You've got to hit rock bottom, man. You've got to get to rock bottom to come back stronger, right? And you know, from everything that everybody read about me then, I'm a different person now, man. And it's because of what happened, you know? That made me a much better person. So I just heard, and, and you know, it's really weird because I'm a very spiritual guy, right? I'm not religious. Even though I believe in my religion, I follow my religion, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a religious person, but I do my part and like, I, I'm, I'm more spiritually connected. And, you know, I believe that if you put out good into the universe, those vibrations, they come back to you, right? And those kind of things are very important to me now, is, is just trying to keep positive, um, stay focused, and, and just deal with every day as that 24 hours, one day at a time. Just deal with things one day at a time. If you think you've got to do something for the rest of your life, you're going to fail before you've even started. If you say, I've just got to do this for the next 24 hours, mate, anybody can do that. It's achievable. And by doing that thing one day at a time, you'll be at 10 months and 10 and a half months. I gave up drinking on the 15th of October last year, right? And it was one day at a time for me. And right now, I'm nearly going to be celebrating one year of being sober again, right? At this time, I've thrown in the towel completely and said, I won't ever drink again. Because if I drink, it leads to a lot of other things, you know? And I'm now helping other people. You know, this that's another story where I will probably come out soon about it and, and yeah. talk about it on a on a wider why on a wider spectrum, you know, where I'm putting myself out there to help other people go that might have been through stuff that I've been through. You know, I'm so glad you said that because when I reflect when I reflected back on the no filter one, there was a point in interview with Bobby Friction, there was a point in there where I come from an addictions kind of background where I, uh, you know, for substance misuse and rehabs and, and whatnot. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, there's no, but everybody knows that there's issues within the South Asian community around the, this whole subject matter. And no one has got the, no one has taken the brave decision to come out and be that one person that they can anchor and say, this guy's done it. He's come out of it and look at him now. Because if you, if you think about it in all, in like mainstream media, Robbie Williams had a massive cocaine issue. He's got a drink issue. He's come out of it and he's fine. Robbie Williams. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, Bro, there's loads, it's, man. It's, Robbie Williams, Elton John, Russell Brand. It's, yeah, just it's, to it's, a, it's a rite of passage to have that in the, in that thingy. And it's and it, in some ways it acts, it acts, it, it enhances their career. <laughs> you know what I mean? But we try and pretend that there's not none of those issues going on from, from that side. And there isn't a focal person or anchor point to be the first one to say, you know, someone had an issue, had a problem. I've come out of it. Look at me now. I'm moving forward. Anybody need it need support? Use me. I'm the I'm there to do that. And I asked Bobby. I said, Bobby, what? You know, there was a point there. I said where you could. This was privately. So there's a point. Why? And he goes, 
he goes, I, I just didn't, he didn't want to put you in that position, which I completely understand because uh, from that yeah. side. But like you doing this, that, and what you are potentially going to do forward, even that one action will save so many people from that way. I just think sure. that is the the yeah. thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say one little thing, yeah. Um, like I said, um, you have to go through bad times to get to your best times of your life. Yeah, you know where. I mean, in that at that time, you know, like you were saying, you realize who your friends are. I've stopped talking to a lot of people because a lot of people that I expected to be there for me at that time, just to even just to put a little call in, you know, and just to see if I was okay. I don't, I'm like nothing, nothing more. Yeah. Um, some people shocked me. Uh, some people I expected didn't expect anything from, and some people that that messaged me or, or or did check in on me, I was totally blown away. I didn't like, oh, I didn't even expect that to come from that person. But regardless, that's just. That's just part of what happened, yeah? But where I am today, with God's grace, I'm in a place where, you know, in my head, I'm there to just do seva now. I want to do some seva, you know? And this form of seva comes from what I'm currently doing, which we'll talk about another time um, on, on, a, on, a, on a much bigger scale because I'm not fully ready because I'm still working on myself. Uh, but I'm nearly there, you know? And I'll be able to then go, you know what, I can now comfortably, and I'm not ashamed to talk about stuff, bro. I'm not ashamed to talk about stuff. I think, in fact, it makes, it helps me when I talk, and I and this is what I share with my friends that I'm trying to help at the moment as well, um, that, you know, if I talk to you and you talk to me, it makes me stronger. So um, it will happen soon, man. It'll happen soon. I want to, I'm thinking like of, of so many things. I want to write a book, you know. Um, no more than like, that. That's the first, that's the other thing that people need to do. Yeah, I'm going to write the book. I'm going to write the book. I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'm going to write a book. Um, we're talking to a few other people about about this journey, man. This journey, there's, there's a lot of stories that need to be told, man. Um, and I feel my story can help a lot of people. You get me? Podcast, so, man. Do a podcast. Yeah. I think, I think, I mean, podcast is great, but I think, um, I, I think, you know what? Podcast requires a lot of time as well and a lot of um, uh, <laughs> stuff, you know? And I don't, I, I'm still, like I said, fortunately, I'm, I'm still gigging a lot, you know, traveling a lot, gigging a lot. And when I sit down, I just want to sit down and just do nothing sometimes, yeah. you know. Like today, I was just about to jump online and it started raining outside. I had to run out to go and take the cup off the washing line. Yeah. <laughs> That's as rock star. You know, one of the, and it's one of the biggest things that um, when I've worked with clients and, and stuff before, when they've said, you know, what do you want to do? And you know what the biggest thing they say? We would just love to be bored, uh, pay a bill, take down the washing, make, you know, those things, because then they're not thinking about other kind of stuff. Managing the, the downtime is the biggest challenge of going in there. And especially if if you've done a piece, if you've done a good thing or you heard a particular song or you've ate something, you try to recreate that. Humans are habitual animals where we want to recreate those good times. And, you know, yep. you, people are going to naturally go down go, go down that road. I just want to, I'm just going to move it on and kind of bring it, bring it in, back in, especially for, for, for you now. I mean, you've been responsible for quite a lot of new talent coming in there now. And you see the, the market the way that it is. And, you know, your longevity is, is, is brilliant. You've reinvented yourself con consistently. And this new, you know, this, I would class it this new era of what you're doing in now. What do you think the future holds for you? So uh, the future for me is um, is positive, man. It's very positive to say the least. It's uh, because my my head's in a, in a in a positive position, and I and I'm able to deal with um, uh, issues in life on life's terms, you know. Um, and I don't I don't see things as a problem anymore because um, I'm able to deal with them better. You know, maybe if I was not in in a position that I'm in right now where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm clean and sober and, and teetotal and I don't even eat meat anymore. You know, I gave up eating meat about three months ago. So I'm a pescatarian now. So, you know, my life is heading in a really nice direction and, and, and I'm grateful for that. Um, and, and, you know, the biggest thing is not everybody gets that chance, man. God don't give everybody a chance uh numerous times you know I, I i sometimes say this to my mates i say uh to my close ones i said look i've used all my lives man i said I'm, I'm i don't have any more chances left at life you know 
um, I think I'm very, very fortunate, very lucky to be alive, you know. Um, and my future is positive because I've got like 12, 10 or 12 brand new songs ready uh, that are sitting there. And um, I'm, I'm in a position of like now going, okay, what do I do? For the me? album. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I was thinking like maybe three or four singles and then an EP, but there's, there's enough. Like I was playing, I was in Glasgow the other day and I was with um, G Town Dissy Boys, uh, Bobby. He's a very, very close friend of mine. I've known him for many years. And uh, we were jamming and we were doing some stuff in the studio and um, I was playing him new music and he's looking at me going, bro, what the hell? You've got so much material there. This is nuts. Like, it's crazy, you know? Um, and so musically, I've got a lot of stuff ready to release, uh, which I'm very happy about. Uh, personally, I'm I'm growing as a, as a person. I think um, I've just kind of got into this place where like I was saying I want to I want to help people you know help people that have been through a similar journey as mine um and and that's kind of more or less it man and you know obviously by being if you're in a better place you're a better person for the people around you your kids your family um and 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 your and your working peers and I've found that in the last year since since I've sobered up again completely um, not that I was a, a, a everyday drinker, but when I did drink, I was, it was all or nothing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Again, coming back to that point. Um, but oh, I found make a that... t-shirt, I want commission, by the way, all or nothing. Juggy D, all or nothing. That's the yeah. album. That's the EP. There you go. All or nothing, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I've uh, I now just kind of go like, you know what? I'm I'm just looking around and I'm I'm getting calls from people um that want to work with me, you know. Um again and so many different ideas they're throwing at me going oh this and let's do that and, and I'm thinking this has all come from just me being that positive person and mm. I'm fixing myself up again you know mm. so as much as as bad as that time was I look back at it and think you know what it's actually you know see see the comeback is always better than the setback if you learn from it Right, and everybody loves that. Everybody well, loves comeback. <laughs> everybody loves a good comeback story. Yeah. And my comeback story, bro, is powerful, bro. It's powerful because I've been, I've been in the darkest, dirtiest place mentally. You know, like it's been difficult, bro. I'm not gonna lie, mm. it's been tough. But anything is possible, man. You put your mind to it, bro. You put your mind to it. Anything is possible. And it's, that, it's going to be that thing. If I can do it, anyone can do it. And when you hear the story, you know, when you hear the story, you, uh, there's, there's certain things that people don't even know about and they'll be shocked. They'll be like, nah, That's the book. I can't believe that. You know, and that will be, that will be my strength to help other people. Not, I'm not proud of it, but it's going to work in that favor where it's going to make somebody else go, Wow, listen, if he can do it, I can definitely do it. Yeah. So that's how it's going to help. So last question now. Um, so this is called the bandwagon. Um, so quite often people jump on a bandwagon and um, people can jump off one. Uh, this is an opportunity for you. Is there a bandwagon you'd like to jump on or off? Or is there anything you want to clear off your chest? This is your, this is your opportunity. Uh, I think... I think we were the bandwagon. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We were the bandwagon, man. Whether it was, whether it was, whether it was, oh, we need to do music like the Richard Rich Project, or I want to party like Juggy. <laughs> we were the bandwagon, man. But you know, I listen. Look, see, I'm I'm a very headstrong guy in that sense. I don't follow trends, man. Yeah, I've never been one to go. Oh, I need to do that. I need to do this because. The, I understand that that works for them. It's not going to work for me, yeah. you know? But what I do believe in is just being creative, you know, and uh, and doing things the way you want to do them. Just have a, a experiment. Don't worry about... I don't I don't look at it as a, as a bandwagon. I look at it jumping on. I just look at it as as being creative and, um, and, and trying different things. So when we look at... If we look at the songs that I've done, I've got 10, 12 new brand, brand new songs ready, right? I've done a song with myself, Jay Sean and Rishi, right? That's ready. Uh, that, my my mate, when he heard it, he said, oh my God, this just sounds like a mature Rishi Rich project. Like it's still got the elements of your old school sound, but you can just hear that you guys have grown up. And it's like, that gave me an idea straight away. The that gave me an idea. 
<laughs> it's like the sexy uncles, the all grey hair now sitting in the corner. No, it's, it's boys to men, bro. It's boys to men, you know? Yeah, it's boys to men. It's like, that is what we are. We've gone from boys to men mm -hmm. and we're still together doing stuff. And when we do stuff together, it still works. Yeah. Like I've heard this record, like obviously numerous times and it's, it's not a Rishi Rich project track, but it's the three of us on it. It was Juggy D featuring Jay Sean and it's produced by Rish. So that's there. I've done collaborations with some mainstream artists. They're there. I've done an Afrobeats track. I've done a, a Senti, like a, a like love song, a proper Punjabi stroke Bollywood love song. I've done a Bollywood track. I've done a Desi, full on Desi, like kind of, you know, that West Coast sound, like the yeah, yeah. Karan Sidhu kind of style, kind of in, in a way that I've done something like that. So I've done something across the board. There's so many different things that I've done, um, experimented with, and they're all sitting there ready. And it's like, it's weird if I, if I just did one of those and didn't have anything else to play, they'd go, oh, he's just jumping on that bandwagon. Yeah. But because now I've got 10, 12 songs ready, when I sit down and play them to people, they go, bro, oh my God, you've done a bit of everything here. And every single one that you played us, it sounds good. Yes. So that's just being a creative, not yeah. jumping on a bandwagon, just being a creative. So what I would say to anybody is don't jump on a bandwagon. Just do what you feel you want to do and be the best at it. Just give it your all. And as long as you're happy with it, that's good enough because you know in this world, you're never going to please everybody. So just don't even think about trying to please everyone. Please yourself. Just make sure you do stuff that makes you happy. And Baki Rabbi Dehatia. Wow. And on that note, I'm going to bring it to a close. Uh, Joy, I really appreciate the, your time today. And, um, oh, and, I, and, I, and, you know, and you're, you know, I feel good. I feel good listening to how you see, you know, what you've done. And I think that positivity, it just radiates out of you. And uh, no, I'll say, yeah, we will get you back on and I will, you know, go for it. And I'm there as a, as a help support, whatever I can do in my network, sphere influence, I'll do, man. And uh, really appreciate it. And, um, it's a long time in the making, bro. Oh no! It just last right at the last second, just froze. It's all right. <laughs> it's fine, it's man. Right. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Shalom. All right, bro. Well, listen, Ricky. Thank you for having me, and hopefully, you know, people that watch this can take something positive from this, and it will help them, um, or just give them a little bit of inspiration. So, once again, namaskar, salam, sasrikal, and uh, see you later.